Hello everyone, and welcome to Scary Interesting and to another collection of Horrible Fates. The stories you're about to hear range from bizarre to absolutely horrifying. In particular, the final story has one specific event that is so terrifying and unbelievable that I wouldn't believe it at all if not for the proof found at the end. As always, viewer discretion is strongly advised. This is a blue-ringed octopus. There are four species of them worldwide that we know about, and all of them are extremely venomous. They're found in tide pools and around coral reefs in Pacific and Indian Oceans all the way from Australia up to Japan. They're generally yellowish in color with beautiful blue and black rings all over their bodies. They can change color dramatically when they're threatened, and they're also some of the world's most venomous marine animals and are extremely dangerous to humans. Just a single blue-ringed octopus has enough venom to kill 26 people in minutes. But even worse than the potency of the venom is the effect the venom has. The venom is very unique and results in a terrifying condition. The main component of it causes motor paralysis of the muscles, but not just the muscles around the bite. It causes paralysis of the muscles around the entire body. As a result, most of the people who've died from these bites have died from suffocation because their diaphragms are literally paralyzed and can no longer inflate their lungs. So just imagine you're swimming along in the ocean and unbeknownst to you, somewhere in the water, you encounter a blue ringed octopus. Without realizing it, it became threatened and gave you a small, painless bite. A little while later, you start to feel a bit nauseous and a bit off. Then you start to find it hard to move your arms and legs until you're finding it hard to tread water. And suddenly, you can't move your arms at all and your head dips below the surface. And then you slowly sink to the bottom with no way to resurface. What's worse is that the venom can even cause a total body paralysis where the person is still fully aware of their surroundings but can't move at all. This means they can't even call for help. You just have to hope that you're lucky enough for someone to see that something's wrong because there's absolutely nothing that can save you otherwise. One day, a man was on the beach somewhere in the Pacific enjoying the warm sun and warm water. He'd been in and out of the water checking out the sea life and coral reefs when he randomly started to feel a little bit nauseous and generally just a little bit strange. As the feeling got stronger, he knew he needed to get out of the water, so he made his way to the shore to sit down on the beach where all of his stuff was. As he walked across the sand, this feeling got stronger and stronger until he was finding it hard to keep walking. Eventually, he just collapsed into the ground in the shock of people nearby. They immediately called a lifeguard who ran over and started checking the man. As far as the lifeguard could tell, the man wasn't breathing. His pulse was almost non-existent, but his eyes were wide open. This prompted him to roll the man onto his back and start performing CPR. This was incredibly lucky for the man. This is basically the only way to save someone from the effects of the venom. The mechanical action of the pumping on his chest kept the man's blood flowing through his body in the absence of his heart being able to beat and the air breathed into his lungs delivered crucial oxygen to his brain and vital organs. Another interesting thing about the venom is that it's actually only temporary. It's eventually metabolized in the body and the effects wear off completely provided the person doesn't die while paralyzed. So after some time performing CPR, the man started to twitch. This eventually became stronger until the man was able to move again. Most people are even completely normal 24 hours after a bite. Unfortunately and horrifyingly for the man, because he had been paralyzed with his eyes open, as he faced the sun while having CPR performed, the sun burned his corneas completely and he was left permanently blind. He would make a full recovery from the venom, but unfortunately, his sight was gone forever. In the summer of 1951, the charred remains of a 67-year-old woman were found in the living room of her Tampa Bay apartment. Most of the body was reduced to ash, but an unburned foot, a section of spine, and a grotesque shrunken skull remained. As a medical doctor, Mary's son Richard probably would have noticed if she'd been acting strangely or feeling under the weather when he visited on the evening of July 1st, 1951. Mary hadn't eaten dinner yet because she was worried that a trip she'd planned to visit friends back in Pennsylvania might fall through, but other than that, nothing else seemed out of the ordinary. Before Richard left, Mary told him that she'd probably take a few sleeping pills, change into her nightgown, and smoke one last cigarette before turning in for the night. The following morning, her landlord, Pansy Carpenter, stopped by to deliver a telegram, but Mary didn't answer the door when she knocked. Pansy then tried to open the door to check on Mary, but found that the doorknob was actually hot to the touch. This prompted her to run home and call the police so they could force their way in and check on her, because Pansy could only think of one reason why the doorknob would be hot from the outside. Officers quickly arrived, but neither they nor Pansy were prepared to find a pile of ashes and body parts where Mary's recliner had once been. Mary's exposed spine and miniature skull were bad enough, but weirdly, the bottom portion of her leg was in almost perfect condition, and her foot was still inside a black slipper that hadn't been burned in the least. 
Word of the scene spread quickly, and news outlets across the country reported that her body had been incinerated by a fire or a heat source of almost unimaginable intensity. A few plastic electric outlet covers had melted, and the tops of adjacent walls and ceilings were dusted with soot, but weirdly as well, most of the apartment had no signs of being anywhere near heat or fire. In fact, a newspaper just a few feet away was totally unburned, and Mary's white bedsheets looked like they'd just come back from the cleaners. As the initial investigation was being performed by the St. Petersburg Police Department, a number of interesting tips came in. One witness apparently saw a ball of fire enter Mary's window. Another claimed that Mary was murdered and cremated somewhere else and that her killer or killers returned her remains to the apartment afterward. Police considered both scenarios unlikely, but nearly a month into the investigation, they were still stumped otherwise. The police chief said he'd never seen such an odd case in nearly three decades in the force, and with public desperate for answers and no reasonable theories other than spontaneous human combustion, the police chief reluctantly contacted the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. The investigators then sent multiple boxes of material and other evidence taken from Mary's apartment to an FBI lab in Washington for further analysis. Meanwhile, since there was no evidence of arson or a rogue lightning strike, people put forth the idea that her death was due to spontaneous human combustion. In theory, this occurs when some internal chemical reaction causes a body to burst into flames. Stories of this happening date back centuries, but the idea that this can even occur at all has been largely debunked. The FBI would rule it out after just a few weeks too after examining the scene and the material taken from the site. No trace of chemical accelerants were ever detected, and they considered the lightning strike angle far-fetched at best. What they came up with was a much more plausible scenario involving something called the wick effect. The wick effect occurs when an external fire or heat source ignites fat inside a body after which the skin and clothes act like the wick of a candle or an oil lamp. Under the right conditions, the fat-saturated wick can burn for a surprisingly long time and reduce the body almost entirely to ash. This is particularly true with people who have higher than average body fat and who are wearing flammable clothing. And incredibly, in addition to weighing approximately 170 pounds, Mary was wearing a flammable nightgown the night she died. FBI investigators concluded that the most likely scenario was that Mary had taken her sleeping pills on an empty stomach shortly after Richard left. Then, she lit a cigarette and promptly fell asleep while it was still lit. Next, an ember or the cigarette itself fell onto her nightgown, it caught fire, and was subsequently fueled by Mary's body fat and the air from the open window. Sadly, Mary might have woken up if not for the sleeping pills, so as heartbreaking and grisly as it was, Mary's friends and relatives generally agreed with the FBI's findings. As for the undamaged apartment, they chalked up to the sparse furnishings, a concrete floor, and the fact that Mary's easy chair had a few feet of empty space around it in either direction. With that said, not everyone was convinced that the FBI had it right. A renowned anthropologist from the University of Pennsylvania who consulted on the case said he couldn't imagine how the body could have burned so completely with such negligible damage to the surrounding apartment. He also pointed out that it typically takes two hours of sustained temperatures between 1400 and 2000 degrees to cremate a body, and that arson couldn't be ruled out because the fire itself could have eliminated all trace of chemical accelerants. Some skeptics were also perplexed by Mary's shrunken skull. They pointed to the fact that it should have been cracked or maybe even exploded due to the intense heat, but in fact, this is another urban myth that isn't really known to happen. So in the end, Mary probably died from her careless smoking, her body composition, and a flammable nightgown. Tragically, the telegram her landlord had been trying to deliver to her that morning was the friend from Pennsylvania. Sadly, she just wanted to check with Mary to know that all the necessary trip preparations had been made. The North American Great Lakes might be some of the more deceptive waters on Earth. Located along the border between Canada and the United States, the five lakes are popular destinations for summer vacationers. But the lake's now friendly reputation somewhat overshadows their history as ruthless and unforgiving bodies of water. For those of you not familiar with the Great Lakes, they're not your average small town fishing hole. They live up to their name, both in size and treacherousness. Combined, they account for roughly 21% of the world's fresh water by volume, and when weather conditions get dicey, the lakes behave more like small oceans. The violent swells and rogue waves that you'd find there come close to rivaling anything you'd find in the Atlantic or Pacific. And if you think that's an exaggeration, consider that the Great Lakes have combined to sink an estimated 6,000 ships and claim more than 30,000 lives. Some historians even think that the number of shipwrecks could be close to 25,000. Incredibly, this is despite the fact that the Great Lakes aren't sailed year-round either. Because of their brutal climates the winter, they aren't sailable at all for that part of the year, so many of those shipwrecks occurred in the absence of ice or intense winter winds. When winter does set in, most ships are docked until warm weather returns. Shipping companies will try to stretch their seasons as far as the weather allows, but this is still usually only until late November or early December if they're lucky. In 1966, the Great Lakes shipping industry wasn't so fortunate. Winter arrived earlier that year, forcing crews to ready their ships to dock for the next few months. 
The crew of the Daniel Johnson Morrell were completing their last few tasks before giving the 603-foot freighter its annual winter off when an unexpected call came in. A different freighter that was supposed to deliver a load of iron ore from Minnesota to Buffalo experienced mechanical problems and wouldn't be able to make the run. And with most other freighters already docked, the task was given to the Morrell. And although this undid all the work they put into getting the Morrell ready for winter, another run was another payday for the crew. So, the 29 men on board shifted gears and the Morrell pulled out of the port into Lake Erie and began its journey to Minnesota. Construction on the Morrell was completed in 1906 and it soon became the longest ship in service on the Great Lakes, earning the nickname Queen of the Lakes. And even more than 60 years later, the Morrell was still more than capable of efficiently and safely completing the routine run, even on such short notice and with the increased threat of inclement weather. Joined by its sister ship, the Edward Y. Townsend, the Morrell would make its way from the extreme eastern point of Lake Erie into Lake Huron before it would turn northwest toward Lake Superior and then into Minnesota. On November 28th, just a day after the Morrell left port in Lackawanna, New York, signs of a storm grew more apparent as the wind and swells gradually picked up. By nightfall, the Morrell and the Townsend were being hammered by 70 mile an hour winds and swells that topped the height of both ships. After hours of this, the captain of the Townsend decided it wasn't worth the risk and decided to seek shelter from the storm in the early morning hours of November 29th. Meanwhile, the Morrell continued fighting its way north, further and further into Lake Huron. At some point after the Townsend reversed course, the captain of the Morrell also realized that the risk of continuing on was too great, especially considering the state of his ship. When freighters cross the Great Lakes, the companies that own them make the most out of every nautical mile by hauling loads to and from different ports. An empty ship is a ship that's not making money. Had this occurred during prime shipping season, the Morrell would have been loaded up in Buffalo with material meant for Minnesota, where it would then be swapped for a load of material meant for Buffalo. But because the Morrell was filling in for a disabled ship and the shipping season was all but over, it was making the trip to Minnesota with nothing on board but its crew. As you might imagine, the weight difference between an empty ship and one loaded to capacity with iron ore is massive. The more weight a ship has on it as well, the more stable it is, particularly in conditions like the one it was in at the moment. Without any ballast in its hull, the Morrell was no match for the churning whitecaps Lake Huron had become, and the captain decided it was time to retreat. Below deck, Dennis Hale, a 26-year-old watchman, had somehow been able to sleep through most of the storm. When things turned violent around 2 that morning, Dennis was awoken by a loud bang. In weather like that, it is common for the ship to sway so much that it causes the anchor to hit against the hull, so Dennis closed his eyes and went back to sleep. Then when he heard a second and louder bang and saw books falling off the shelf across the room, he jumped out of bed. Wearing only his boxers, Dennis grabbed a pea coat and a life jacket and made a beeline for the deck. Even just by the sounds it was making, the crew knew that it would go down at any moment. These groans were unlike anything they'd ever heard before. They scrambled to abandon the ship and prepare a life raft when another noise none of them had ever heard before temporarily halted the chaos. When the men looked in the direction of the sound, they saw the Morel's bow and stern shear into two pieces. The ship was splitting in half right in front of their eyes. Without a moment to spare, Dennis turned and hopped into the raft while other crewmen who weren't close enough to the raft jumped into the near freezing water to escape the sinking bow. Three of his crewmates then swam to the raft and Dennis pulled them out of the freezing water. Just then, they heard shouts from other crewmen that another ship was approaching from the port side. In a stroke of luck, a nearby ship must have seen the morale break apart and hurry to rescue the crew. As unlikely as it was, they thought they were as good as saved. Unfortunately, when the ship was close enough to identify, what they saw was beyond belief. It wasn't another ship, it was their ship. The morale's stern, still powered by its engine, was barreling straight for them. And the raft they were on had no engine or paddles, so there was nothing the men could do but watch the stern close the distance. It then got closer and closer, but then by some miracle, the stern's propeller must have been slightly angled because it turned away from the raft and missed them. The four men then watched it speed off and disappear into the stormy night, and with it, their only source of light. As the sound of the engine faded and was replaced only by the waves and the wind they were now exposed to, they started to process what had happened and the danger they were in. They were now on an inflatable pontoon boat in the middle of Lake Huron with the same storm that just sank their 600-foot freighter. Incredibly, the raft somehow managed to survive the night and the storm, but as the sun started to rise, Dennis saw that two of his crewmates had died, likely from hypothermia. Their clothes were so crusted with ice, they were essentially frozen solid. Tragically, later that afternoon, the last of Dennis's crewmates died, leaving him alone in the middle of Lake Huron. About 12 hours after the Morel broke apart and sank, the Townsend pulled into Sault Ste. Marie, which is a city between Lake Huron and Lake Superior. The crew expected to meet up with the morale there and continue on to a harbor in Minnesota, but there was no sign of the ship or its crew. 
Knowing how bad the storm was, the Townsend immediately contacted the Coast Guard to report the ship missing. The Coast Guard then put out an alert for all ships to be on the lookout for the morale and sent several rescue boats and aircraft to search for the missing freighter. Meanwhile, Dennis drifted in and out of consciousness and started hallucinating from his worsening hypothermia. By that afternoon as well, Dennis was so hungry and thirsty that he considered eating the ice off his coat. Just as he was about to, a vision of an elderly man with a white beard begged him not to because it would lower his body temperature and reduce his chances of survival. Then that night, the raft floated close enough to land for Dennis to even see the lights of the homes and farms on the shore. He fired off a few flares but received nothing in response. As the night wore on, he spent most of the time praying and at one point when he lost consciousness, he even felt himself being pulled up into the clouds and described it as a profoundly euphoric experience. This was then immediately followed by the feeling of being slammed back into his own body. At 4 o'clock the next afternoon, a helicopter spotted a raft with what looked like four bodies in it. After almost 38 hours had passed since the morale sank, the Coast Guard was close to changing the status of their search from rescue to recovery, but they were stunned to find that Dennis had a pulse. He was airlifted to a nearby hospital where things looked so bleak that he was given his last rites. Still, Dennis held on and in the following days he improved more and more until his condition was upgraded to stable. He'd then spend the next few weeks in the hospital before finally being released. Later, Dennis credited his own lack of clothing with saving his life after seeing how thick and rigid the ice was on the clothing of his dead crewmates. Of the 29 men who were on board the ship, 28 passed away and only 26 of the bodies were ever recovered. Most of them were found in the days after the sinking, but others washed ashore as late as the following May. The two men whose bodies were never found were officially declared dead in 1967. Later, an investigation into the morale sinking revealed four main causes extreme weather, an overconfident captain, an empty hull, and a manufacturing defect. Until the late 1940s, ships that sailed the Great Lakes were built using steel that had a high sulfur content. When this type of steel is subjected to freezing conditions, it becomes brittle and more susceptible to cracking. Ships built after 1948 were already made with a different type of steel that's more durable in extreme temperatures, so it was already known prior to the morale sinking that better steel existed for ship construction. What wasn't known, however, was how dangerous inferior steel was when other variables were at play. In fact, if any one of the four main causes of the morale sinking hadn't been present that night in 1966, there's a chance the ship and its crew might have been fine. Later, the morale stern was found about 18 miles north of Port Austin, Michigan in 1967, but the bow wasn't located until 1979. When the whereabouts of the two sections were known, more of the morale story could be stitched together. Coincidentally, the bow and stern both rest completely upright on the bottom of Lake Huron and are separated by about six miles. And interestingly, divers report that the clocks in each section stopped at different times. In the bow, the clocks were stuck at 2.15 a.m., only about 15 minutes after the first signs of trouble. The stern, on the other hand, was still being powered by its engine after it separated from the bow. Its clocks didn't stop until after 5 o'clock that morning, indicating that it spent up to three hours sailing around Lake Huron in the dark before the engine finally died and it sank. As for Dennis, life was never the same after he was released from the hospital. Doctors told him that his body temperature was far below normal when he arrived at the hospital, which resulted in severe damage to his extremities. Over the years, he'd go through more than 12 surgeries directly related to his 38-hour ordeal. The feeling in his hands and feet didn't fully return for years after the sinking, and he suffered from PTSD and survivor's guilt for the rest of his life. His injuries meant he'd never sail again, so he trained to become a tool and die maker in an attempt to establish a new sense of normal. When he wasn't at work, he'd hole up in his house and avoid going out in the public because everyone he came across would stare at him. For almost 20 years, Dennis refused to talk about the sinking because it was too mentally and emotionally painful for him to recount. That changed in 1982 when a film about the shipwreck was made and Dennis was invited to speak at the premiere. He told his story for the first time in front of 300 people and when he left the stage that night, he felt like he shed the crushing weight he had been carrying for those 16 years. It was then that he knew his purpose in life was to keep the memory of the morale and its crew alive. From that night in 1982, Dennis took every opportunity he could to share what happened to the morale with newspapers and TV stations and during speaking engagements at libraries, museums, and schools. He later wrote an autobiography called Shipwrecked, Reflections of the Soul Survivor, and in 1998, he joined the Marine Museum in his hometown as its curator, and he spoke frequently about his experience with visitors. Dennis finally passed away on September 2nd, 2015, from cancer at the age of 75. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this set of stories. And if you're not sure about which event I was talking about in the intro, it was when the back half of the ship was barreling toward the men. The mental image I have of a massive ship coming directly toward them in the darkness is one of the scariest things I think I've ever read.
In any case, just a reminder, we now have a scary interesting podcast where you'll find more stories just like this released every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. The link for the podcast is in the description. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to send it to me using the email in the description. And once again, thank you so much for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.